Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Good evening. It's Tuesday night. We're going to be discussing the subject tonight of worldliness. The subject of worldliness. Now, I have quite a bit of scripture that I want to cover uh, toward the end of this teaching. I'll, I'm going to go a little deeper at the end, and I'm going to, I'm going to do maybe, if you want to call it some preaching, but at the beginning of this, I just want to lay down a lot of scripture because it's not really important, as important what I have to say as what the Word of God says. So I want to lay this out, and for some of you, these scriptures may be familiar. Hey, Eldon, God bless you, brother. These scriptures may be familiar. Miguel, hello, God bless you. To most of you, it's just going to be a refresher, uh, but maybe to some people who will listen to this video, they've never really heard any teaching on worldliness. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't think there's a lot of teaching on it today because there's so much worldliness in the church that I don't think many preachers can preach on worldliness because they themselves are living so worldly. So it is a sad shame that there's not more teaching. Hey, Art and Marty, God bless you guys. It's sad that there's not more teaching. In fact, uh, uh, you have to go back, I think, in the books in the 1800s and early 1900s to even hear the word worldliness. Uh, and it's unfortunate because I'd, I would encourage you, Adam, hey brother, God bless you. I would encourage you to just go take that word world and do a, a word study on the word world and see what the Bible has to say. I've, I've done a lot of study and I'm, I'm going to give you just a, a number of scriptures that I think are important. But there's many, many more that I, if I covered them all, we'd be here for hours. So I'm going to give you this short list, and I want, I want to just give you enough to set the stage for what I'm going to talk about at the end. And this will be elementary, but toward the end, I'm going to go deeper in this and make it practical to our everyday life. Uh, so we'll start here with this list of scriptures that I've written down. Um, first of all, worldliness is, is it's a system, it's a corruption, um, but... I, I want to look at it tonight from God's perspective, not necessarily, I mean, we've said before worldliness is a sin, and of course worldliness is a sin, we're going to see that in the scripture, but, you know, it's one thing to say worldliness is bad, don't do it, and then, you know, when you discipline your kids and they say, but why, you know, and then we, we don't really have an answer, we just say, well, because I said so, just don't do it, but they want to know and understand why, and I think this is a subject First of all, it's hard to even to even preach because worldliness, I guess, is sub, is subjective when you talk to people. I mean, some people think this is worldliness. I mean, there are some people that think if a girl wears pants, it's worldliness. So, obviously, there's going to be a, dif a difference of opinion on what worldliness is, and I'm not I'm not going to get into the the uh, little details of what you should wear, what you can eat, and all these other. I th I think that's where we get into legalism. But to come against worldliness is not to be legalistic. It's not to set rules for people uh, and say you can't eat this or you can't dress like this or you, you can't have this kind of music or you can't have this kind of whatever. A lot of things that we, we, we talk about are just preferences. They're, they're what we think is, is right or wrong. And I'm not going to cover that. I just want to talk directly from God's perspective about worldliness because I don't think we've considered it uh, maybe gone going back all the way to the beginning of the world and how God sees the world And I think that's our problem is we don't see the world like God sees the world So to go back first before I start giving you all these scriptures Just think about the, the world in its original form when God created the world God created Adam and he created Eve He created man for the world. He created the world for man And so was the case that God let and uh, the, hey Lawrence God bless you God let Adam name the animals. I think that is an amazing picture that God was so uh, wanted to bring man into the involvement of the world, the creation, and, and the forming of it because the world was man's, man's possession. He was to, to take dominion over the earth. So the world originally, as it was created by God, was pure, it was holy, it, it was without sin, it was, it, was our, it was our heritage from God, it was our blessing. We were to take authority over, to name the animals. Adam was allowed to, to take dominion and have free reign. They walked naked. There was no corruption. They didn't even know what sin was. Hey, Christina, God bless you. Now, what you fast forward, when, when Satan came in to the picture and he tempted, and, and keep in mind, it's important to think about this, that God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the, in the garden and said, don't eat. Hey, James and Luann, God bless you guys. God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden and said, don't eat from it. Now, why did God ever even put the tree there if he didn't want them to eat from it? It, it, it gives you a clear picture of God's perspective. 
God wants mankind to have an option. God wants mankind to have choices, not to serve him as, as automatons, but to serve him out of love, out of appreciation, out of worship. Hey, Andrew, God bless you, brother. And so God put these two trees. And in fact, all the other trees man could eat from, but that one tree, he said, don't eat from it. Because when you eat from that tree, there's going to be death that comes into humanity because the knowledge of good and evil will come. So he said, don't eat. Now, Satan came in and told man to eat. He, he basically minimized God's commandment and he, he instilled an idea of rebellion in the mind of man. Now, when man caved in to the temptation of Satan, he gave the dominion, the authority that God had given him to Satan. Now, I'm going to quote this one scripture from Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, and it's repeated in Luke chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Uh, Luke's gospel kind of puts a little bit different spin on it, and both are important, but let me read it to you. It said, Again, the devil taketh Jesus, him, up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Up into an exceeding high mountain. So he takes him up to a huge mountain and lets Jesus see down on all the nations and all the glory of them. That is the earth. And he said, If you will fall down and worship me, I will give you all these things. Now in Luke, it says, And the devil said to him, All this power will I give you and the glory of them, the nations, if you will bow down. For listen to what he said, For it is delivered unto me. This is Satan speaking to Jesus. The glory and, and the power and the excellency of the nations has been delivered to me, has been given to me. And it's mine, he said, to give to whomsoever I will. So if you will fall down and worship me, I will give you these nations, these, this world, basically, essentially the, the world that was created by God for Adam. But now Adam delivered it unto Satan when he, when he committed high treason. He gave the dominion, he gave the world and the glory of it to Satan. Now Satan says to Jesus, it's mine, it was delivered to me and I can give it to whomsoever I will. Now we know that Jesus didn't take the bait, but said it is written, devil, and he quotes the scripture, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So the, the devil left Jesus. And he still to this day, the devil still to this day has the nations and he's still the world and he can give it to whomsoever he wills, he can give it. Now, some would say, well, when the cross, when Jesus defeated the devil on the cross, then the devil lost that authority. That's not true because we're, we're told by Paul in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, that Satan is the God of this world and that he blinds all the minds of them that do not believe so that the light of the glorious gospel can't shine on them. So Satan still is referred to as the God of this world. He is a usurper of the authority, but that authority was granted to him by Adam and Eve. Now, when Jesus came and defeated the principalities and powers, made a show of them openly, he didn't fully take back the, the, the dominion or the possession of the earth. Now, if you want to see where he will do that, you go to Zechariah chapter 14, and you'll see that Jesus Christ will touch down on the Mount of Olives, and he will take back the rule of the earth. There are so many scriptures that deal with the re restoration. Uh, Acts 3.21 says that heaven must re re Jesus must remain in the heavens until the restitution of all things on earth. In other words, when Jesus comes back, it's for the time of the restitution of all things. When Jesus comes back, it's to bring restitution or to restore the earth to its proper function. But until then... Even now, the world is under the sway, it says, of the wicked one. Satan is the, is, the, is the God of this world that the spirit, it says, that now worketh in the sons of disobedience. I'll give you all these scriptures. But the world, we have to see it now as a, a, a place where there is a power in place that is not a proper power, that has brought a corruption, a defilement into its system. So now the world that was created by God for mankind to enjoy and to have dominion over was given over to Satan. Satan, it was delivered to Satan by Adam and Eve, and Satan has now corrupted the earth through his sinfulness. Now, we go to John 14, 30, and, and Jesus even says that, Hereafter I will not talk much with you because the prince of this world cometh and he has nothing in me. So, so Jesus calls Satan the prince of the world. I like that because Jesus didn't call him the king because Jesus is rightful king, but he calls him a prince. A prince is a level of authority under a king. So it, Satan is a, a, a power, a prince, a principality is what a prince is. And, and he's put here, he's been given dominion and he has a time here. Just like God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden so man had a choice, so also has God allowed Satan to be a prince 
a god of this world with a little g, a small g. He's a prince and a god, a ruler over this world. He's given him that time allotment until as Zechariah 14 and many other passages describe, Jesus will come back and take back his earth from Satan. And then he will bring everything back into holiness and proper, proper, uh, his proper authority, his proper rule. But up until then, and this is the point I want to get at, we have to see this world as what it is, a, a place filled with the power of Satan, a place infiltrated with a power that's demonic in nature, that has as its end rebellion and pride and evil of all kinds. Now, I think for a lot of Christians, hey, Julie and Tracy, God bless you, a lot of Christians see this world as a not-so-bad place. And if we won't just come out and say it, our behavior is such that we say by our behavior, oh, the world's not so bad. We can enjoy this and this and do this and do this. And we don't have the proper view, God's view, of the world. Therefore, worldliness is an epidemic. And, I'm, and the reason I'm bringing this up, you know, we've been talking a lot about the power of God. We've been talking about the spirit-filled life. The worldliness, I believe, is one of the biggest plagues in the church of today. It, it touches everything, and it is the root of our powerless condition. And by power, let me explain to you, because I've, I've spoken to people, and I, I think I need to get across what I mean. Because when I talk about the power of God, I, I'm not just talking about a ministry function. I'm not just talking about healing the sick, although I am talking about that, or just, or just some supernatural uh, miracle, or, or those are important. But what I'm talking about, when I talk about the power of God, I'm talking about the full gospel benefit. I'm talking about all that Jesus Christ said the church should have. Now, if our experience is less than what the Bible says, we can't change the Bible to fit our experience. Our experience needs to line up with the Bible. The Bible commands that, that the church go and preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons, and speak with new tongues. I mean, that's the very basic elementary call of a believer is to preach the gospel, baptize in Jesus' name, to speak in tongues, to lay hands on the sick and the sick recover and cast out demons. That's Mark 16. If, if you don't like that, that's the Bible. So when I talk about the spirit-filled life, I'm just talking about expecting the results that Jesus Christ promised us. I'm just talking about having our prayers answered. That should be normal. That whatsoever we ask in prayer, we should receive because we do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Now, that, that's what the Bible promises us. So when I talk about living the Spirit-filled life, I'm talking about enjoying the benefits and blessings that were promised to us by God in the Scripture. If it's not in the Scripture, don't, don't expect it. But if it's in the Scripture, why wouldn't you want it? So the full benefit of the gospel or the full gospel is to expect the power of the Holy Ghost. Not just in a church service, but in our home life, in our prayer life, in our activities. We should expect the power of God on our physical bodies. And we should seriously question why we don't see more of the power of God manifesting in our personal lives. So the question is good. Why aren't we experiencing what the Bible says we should be experiencing? Well, the number one reason I would suggest is worldliness. And by worldliness, when you hear that statement, I'm not just talking about sinfulness. Because sinfulness and worldliness can be two totally different things. Remember, the Bible says in Hebrews 12 to lay aside every weight and every sin that does so easily beset us. To run our race, lay aside the weight and the sin. So there's a difference between weight and sin. Weight is things that hold us down and hinder us from walking in the full blessing that the Bible promises. Now, sin is obvious. We know sin goes against the commandment. Now, worldliness, the tricky thing about it is that it's not always just spelled out so clear in the scripture, thou shalt not watch TV. But how many of us know that those believers that watch hours of television have no prayer life? Those believers that sit in front of the television endlessly have not won one soul to God in this entire year or the year previous because the TV has sucked the desire of God right out of their life. Now, so you can't go around saying nobody can watch TV, but practically speaking, whatever is rendering you ineffective to the kingdom of God is worldliness and should be treated as the enemy of God. Now, John 14, 30, we cover 2 Corinthians 4, 4. I want to give you a few scriptures that show us how God sees the issue of worldliness. Because again, we're trying to get God's perspective of the world. God created the world for man. Man gave the pure, holy world, the earth that was designated for our benefit and pleasure to take dominion over, he gave that over to a usurper, 
a demonic force that had a different intention. His intention was rebellion. His intention was abomination. His intention was to corrupt a system, create a system and corrupt a world that was made for God and man to use for his own benefit, which is to go against God. So now the world is spoken of not in good terms. The world is spoken of, listen to Galatians 1.4, says that Jesus gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. So now the world is according to the will of God our Father. So now the world is, is presented or pictured by God as evil, that is corrupt. Now, Ephesians 2.2 2 says that, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Another word for that, where disobedience is rebellion. So the prince of this world is working in all the children of disobedience, creating a rebellion. So the system, the world system is evil and it is full of rebellion. Now this is how God sees it. So now when we buddy up with the system of the world, we have to understand that we're buddying up, we're partnering up with a thing that is the enemy of God. And I'll give you that verse is James 4.4, 4, one I've given often, you know it very well. You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore which will be a friend of this world, is the enemy of God. I mean, that is a staggering scripture. The world is the enemy of God. And somebody said, well, what, didn't say God, God so loved the world that he gave his son? Yeah, God loved the people in the world. God gave his son for people. But the world and the system of the world is called evil, it's called rebellious, and it's called the enemy of God. Now we can see why worldliness is so dangerous because by setting ourselves up with friendship with the world, we set ourselves as enemy with God. How then can we expect the blessing of God, the favor of God, the promises of God to be established? How then can we be effective in the kingdom of God while we're living as friends with the world? God said, come out from among them and be ye separate. Them being the people that are influenced by the devil living in the system of the corruption of the world. So Ephesians six twelve: for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So our war. Notice how many times in the verse, Ephesians 6, 12, it says we wrestle against, against, against. I think there's five times I counted where the word against. We're coming against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Now, the, the rulers of the darkness, these are demonic forces that are invading the earth with demonic influence and seduction and all kinds of evil. Now, we, now, people, you know, say God's in control. Now, God's in control to a certain extent. God is not in control of the world. I mean, it doesn't take a guy with half his sense to look around in the world and see God is not in control of this. If God was in control, there wouldn't be all the sin. There wouldn't be the murder. There wouldn't be the war. There wouldn't be the child, man, uh, child abduction and all, uh, all the other uh, stuff that's going on in the world. If God was in control, we would not see this kind of evil. God has, has given the control of the earth to man. Man gave it to the devil. The devil usurped it and is now using the world to, 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 to do his will and to influence people according to his schedule and his plan. So God is not in control of the world. The world is the enmity against God and God is enmity against the world. Until Jesus Christ comes back to restore all things, the world and all of its influence is demonic at its very root. So... If we don't see it like that, what happens is we allow the world system to influence us. You could just look around at the church, the mainstream church in America today, and see the influence that the world has had, so that the world has come in now, the seduction, the seducement of the world, the corruption of the world has crept into the church now and has brought a level of sin and, and defilement into the into the the church of God to where you can't tell where the world begins and the church ends and the church ends and the world begins. There's such a mingling. Now, I think we need to get back to the identification of what is the world and what is of God. It, it shouldn't be that hard. Unfortunately, it is because so much of, of mainstream Christianity and the leadership of mainstream Christianity has so introduced worldly ideas that the, world ha the church has just gone along with it. And so he, even a guy wants to come out of worldliness, he looks around and well, everybody else is doing such and such. Everybody else is watching all the latest movies. Everybody else is glued to the TV all day Sunday looking at, to see what their favorite sports team is going to do. Everybody else is so seduced and swayed. Surely all 
these people can't be going to hell. They all can't be wrong. So that's the idea and the mindset that we, we allow into our, our hearts. And so we just go and conform to the world. But what did the Bible say? Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of our mind. That is to, and he spoke that to Christians. Christians, we have got to come out from this seduction, this worldly mindset. Allow me a little bit more time, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach my, my perspective on this. Right now, I'm just giving you the scripture. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things in the world. For whoever loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, listen what's in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, that is the desires and passions of the flesh, which I want to hone in on here in a little while. The lust of the eyes, that's what we see that entices us. The lust of the flesh, that's what we want for our physical body. And the pride of life, which is not of God, but is of the world. Now listen to what he said. The world passes away and all the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God abides forever. So the will of God and the world are enmity. They're two totally opposites. And so when you love the world, when you follow after the world, you will never do the will of God because the will of God and the world are opposite each other. So those who love the world, he said, the love of God is not in them and the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes are not of God but are of the world and the world passes away in all of its lust. But he that does the will of God abides forever. So he draws a distinction between those who love the world and those who do the will of God. Jesus confirmed this in Matthew 7, 21. Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, one of the kingdom, but he that does the will of my father father who's in heaven so heaven is a place reserved for those who do god's will we know that we're not of the world we're not living according to the world when we do the will of god now what's the will of god this is so simple this is the will of god even your sanctification obviously sanctification is the will of god but let's get down to the nuts and bolts of what jesus came to accomplish why did jesus come come on think about it real clearly with me why did jesus come on earth to save sinners Primarily, the objective of Jesus was to save people from their sins. Thus, his name is Jesus, for he shall save men from their sins. That's his primary objective. He came to save sinners. He came not to call the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance. G Paul said it this way, I, I, Christ came to save sinners of whom I am chief. So the ultimate objective of Christ's coming is the salvation of mankind. You will know, pay close attention, you will know if you are influenced, if you are under the sway of worldliness by this one major factor. There's many others. This one major factor. How focused are you in the salvation of mankind? How focused are you at saving sinners? How grieved are you over the loss of humanity all around you? Did you know 160,000 People die every single day and go to eternity. Can you imagine the magnitude of this? 160,000 people a day cross from this world to the next world. There is a next world, the other world, the world on the other side. 160,000 a, a day in the world die and cross over and are judged by God either to go to heaven or to go to hell. How troubled, how interested are you in that reality. That right there will tell you all the story. How, in, how influenced, how dominated, how seduced you are with this, uh, this, this worldly uh, intoxication, if you want to call it, because that's exactly what it is. Worldliness intoxicates us so that we are uninvolved, disinterested in what Christ came to accomplish. If, if, if we could just get the magnitude that Jesus Christ laid down his life for the salvation of his people. And, and then he gave us this mandate to go and preach and make disciples. And yet, if you look around or if you look inwardly, you'll see a complete and total disinterest in the salvation of mankind. We can go days and weeks and months without even thinking so much of how we can be used by God to save sinners. Why? Because Satan has been given the power of the, of the glory of the world, and he said he can give it to whomsoever he wills. And so while we're unbelievers, he blinds us so that we can't see the gospel. And then what, when we get the illumination of the gospel and we give ourselves to Jesus, don't think he stops with his delusions. Don't think he stops with his intoxication. He just shifts them from sinful things 
to earthly things. Now, I'm going to talk to you about the difference between sinful things and earthly things. See, earthly things are not sinful things necessarily. There's a passage I was reading today in Luke 14. What an amazing passage. God sends out his, his servants to go invite people to the wedding banquet, to his supper, to the great supper of the Lamb, which is heaven, of course. And he goes out and he invites. And one after one, the people begin to make excuses on why they couldn't come. One said he just bought a piece of land, real estate. Another said he just bought five yoke of oxen. That's his tray, his work. He just try, He has to go try these new oxen that he bought. Isn't that a silly excuse to keep you out of heaven? The third said, I just married a wife. I can't come. So you've got three examples of people invited by God to come and serve in the ministry of Jesus Christ. And the three examples or the three reasons given why they couldn't come were not sinful things. It's not sin to own real estate. It's not sin. Philip had a house. Paul stayed in the house of Philip the Evangelist in the end of the book of Acts. It wasn't sinful for a, a, an evangelist to own a house as long as he used it for the glory of God. It wasn't sinful to have a wife. We know having a wife isn't sinful. Having family, having children isn't sinful by itself. But when your children and your family and your home and your work keep you from serving Christ in the way that he wants us to serve him, then those things become worldly things. Those things become things that have been more valuable, more important to us than the purpose for which Jesus Christ died for. Jesus didn't just come, you know, on a chariot of fire and shout out a few commandments and then go back into heaven. He came down and demoted himself and disrobed himself and stripped himself and suffered and was tortured and humiliated and endured the cross for the purpose of winning mankind. And he gave that work to us. Now, we were all too happy to enjoy salvation for ourselves. And then as narcissistic, worldly creatures, we sit in our homes completely disconnected from the fact that 160,000 people die every day and go to eternity with or without God. And we are the agents, God, call, I mean, that mindset. And the, the Bible goes on to say in Luke 14 that the, 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 the Lord was wroth and angry. And he said, they that I invited into my kingdom shall not taste of my supper. And then he went out and invited in the lame and the halt and the, the downtrodden. He said, those people that I invited, they want to make excuses one after one why they can't come. They're so fixed on their worldly issues. They're, they're, even the blessings of God can get in the way. We say, oh, God's blessed me with this home. And he probably did bless you with that home. But if that home takes all your attention and all your time and all your focus so that you can't go out and do the will of God, then that home, even the thing that came from God, can become a worldly item that is hindering you that is blocking you from the, from the full potential that God has in your life. So what is worldliness? It's whatever is in the world that hinders our seeing, our ability to see. Let me, I'm going to give you four symptoms of worldliness that you're entrapped in worldliness. First and foremost, you have no prayer life. If your prayer life is weak and stagnant, your prayer life is non-existent, that's a symptom of a greater problem. And see, we tell people, you need to pray more, you need to pray more. And people are guilty because they don't pray. They don't pray like they ought. They don't have a serious prayer life with God. And so they, they say, we need to pray more, we need to pray. And you know, you, you agree, I need to pray more. You try to go pray more. It might work for a week or a day or an hour. And what happens? The seduction of the world brings you right away from that, that focus so that you can't, you can't continue it. And, and so the, the problem isn't your lack of prayer as much as it is a, a, a problem with worldliness in your life, sucking out of you all of your hunger for God, all of your hunger for lost souls, all of your hunger for the power of the Holy Ghost, all of your hunger for the activities of the Spirit, because your world, the world system is sucking the life right out of you. So, so a lack of prayer, that's one great symptom of worldliness. Another one is a lack of true study. When the Bible becomes laborious, when the Bible becomes uninteresting, when the Bible becomes labor, hard, difficult for you, and you feel guilty because you're not reading the Bible, and you know, you know people say, you got to read the Bible, you got to read the Bible, so then you get stirred up and you start reading the Bible, but it only lasts an hour, a month, a week, and then you find yourself falling back into a disinterest in the Word. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved. Study. And that doesn't just mean glamour through here and there a few minutes. It means to study the thing. Inhale it. Digest it. Per persevere until you understand the whole tone of the scripture. Not just your favorite six verses, but the whole thing. Become a hungry man who needs to know the word. 
You see, you, you, can, you can guilt people into reading their Bible more, but it doesn't last. Why? Because if you don't deal with the, the, the root of the problem, it's worldliness. If you don't deal with the worldliness, then the Bible is not interesting. Because if you're, you're receiving the, the nutrition of your life from the world, the world is what you're most focused on, most engaged in, then the Bible becomes disinteresting. You'll know when you're being seduced by worldliness when you don't have a hunger for the scripture. More could be said. I already went over the third indication of worldliness ruling your life. It's a lack of interest in souls. If there's one thing God's interested in, it's souls. Everything else, is, it, it works around that. We talk about being filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. Well, what's the power of the Holy Ghost for? Souls. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you and be my witnesses. Being witnesses for Jesus. That's why we need power. We don't need power to watch television. We don't need power to go to church and rub each other's shoulders. We need power to go out and win souls. But if we're disinterested in souls, then why would we need God's power? That's why we're not seeking God's power. We're not interested in the purpose for which the power comes, to be soul winners. I'm not saying this to make you feel bad. I'm saying this to stir you up. My goodness, we need to get interested in what God's interested in. We need to get serious about what God's serious about. We need to get hungry for what God's hungry about. We need to get on fire for what God's on fire about. He's on fire for souls. How much more could he have done to show us that? Now, the last symptom of worldliness is this, your inability to discern your own spiritual condition. It takes preaching like this to stir us up and make us look at ourselves. Now, the, the, the problem with most people is that they're unable to discern their own spiritual condition. Luke 3, 3, 16, Jesus said, I wish you were hot or cold, so then because you're lukewarm, you know the verse, I'm gonna vomit you out. Then he goes on to say, you say you are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. But I say you're poor, miserable, blind, wretched, and naked. Now think about that for a minute. The disconnect that they had, their inability to see themselves in truth, in reality. They said they were rich. Can you imagine? Saying of yourself, I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, and I have no need. I'm doing really well, I'm, I'm on fire, I'm doing great. And then Jesus can come right behind you and say, no, no, no. You're poor, miserable, blind, wretched, and naked. I mean, that's almost scary to think that a person can be that disconnected from reality to see themselves in the light of, 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 of wow, I'm doing so great. And Jesus says, no, you're miserable. You're wretched, actually. I mean, th that brings fear into my own heart. Is it possible that I could be so deceived of my own spiritual condition that I could see myself as great and Jesus could see me as a wretch? How could you come to that place? Because you're intoxicated by the spirit of the world. The value, that you, the value system that you operate under is not the value system of Christ. So you say you're doing great and Jesus says you're not doing good at all. So the value system is off. We need to exchange value systems. I need to value what Jesus values. I need to shun what Jesus shuns. God hates the world. The world is a corrupt entity. He created the world for his goodness and holiness to reign. And now rebellion and evil reigns. And then Christians are so interested in what the world has to offer that we sit in front of television and suck it up. It's the enemy of God, and yet we don't see it as God's enemy. And because it's crept in and seduced us, now our value system's all jacked up. And the only way we can rightly bring ourselves back into right judgment is to see things the way God sees them from his perspective. So now, those are just, that was my introduction. Hey, Robert, God bless you. Chris, God bless you guys. Now, let, let's talk about, I want to talk about the, what I really wanted to talk about. That was just a little introduction. I hope I... Hope I stirred you a little bit. Listen now to the to practicality here. We're talking about, in the last few messages, I've been talking about how important the body is. That your body is the temple of the Spirit of God and that he wants to reign in your body. In 2 Timothy 2, he said that if a man purge himself, his body from these, these worldly, carnal, sinful things, then he'll be a vessel, holy, sanctified, and then meet for the master's use. That means that the master, Jesus Christ, wants to infiltrate your body with his spirit and then operate through your body. I think that is the most amazing revelation I've ever had, that God wants my physical nature to be the demonstration of the power of Jesus Christ's resurrection. However, until we deal with this issue of worldliness, see, our body is, is being used by the devil, not by God. So let me talk to you about the world. What's the purpose of the devil's worldliness? It's for one purpose. It's to entice your body. I want to give you these scriptures about this. It's to entice your body down to the worldly level so that you get in, engulfed 
entertained and fixed on worldly things so that your spiritual life cannot receive from God that virtue that can, if it's, if it's rightly received, the spirit of God can come through your spirit into your body and manifest the purpose of God. So your body will either manifest the purposes of Satan, be interested in the purposes of Satan, or God. And there is no in-between. To be in-between is to be on the devil's side, okay? So we're going to talk about the difference of the body, the soul, and the spirit. Now, the, the soul is the medium, the medium between your spirit and your body. In other words, your soul connects your spirit and your body. Your spirit is this life from God. God gave you your spirit. It's the, it's the flame. The Bible even says that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, the candle. In other words, God's illumination comes through your spirit. We can't access God by the flesh. We don't access God by the soul. The soul is the personality. But listen, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Jesus said the Father is seeking those that will worship him in spirit and in truth because God is spirit so that they worship, they worship him, must worship him in the spirit. So without getting too confusing, your spirit is that invisible part of you that is illuminated by God. The spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. We're born of the spirit. So but when we're living in our dead in our sins, our spirit is dead to God. When we're born again, our spirit man comes alive because the spirit of God comes into our spirit. Born of the spirit, therefore we're born of God. Now, as spiritual beings, now we can receive from the life of God. However, the life of God can only come into our spirit until our soul deals with our body and makes our body fit for the master's use. So we can have all the spiritual ideas that we want to, but they won't be able to manifest in the natural body until the body is made subject to the spirit. In other words, you're either controlled by your body or you're controlled by your spirit and, and, and there's nothing in between. So God's objective is that our bodies would be yielded to his will, that they would hate what he hates and love what he loves, and that he could sanctify our bodies so that they would be meat or fit for the master's use. How do we do that? Now, the soul is the personality of you. You're, when we all go to heaven, we, we will be in spiritual form. We'll have glorified spiritual bodies. What will make your spirit different than my spirit or anybody else's spirit? How will we be able to discern whose spirit is who? It won't be a bunch of invisible ghosts floating around. Your soul is what will give your spirit its personality. So the soul is who you really are. It's the real you. It's, it's the why you do what you do. It's the inner man. It's the thought. It's the faculties of thinking and will and choice. And who I am is determined by my soul. Now the spirit receives life from God and can recondition the soul or the mind. That's why it says, be ye transformed by the renewing of the mind. So the spirit man can receive from God and reconstruct our soul, our personality, to be yielded and consecrated to God. And therefore our soul can command our body and say, body, you aren't gonna sin like that anymore. You aren't gonna think like that anymore. You're not gonna talk like that anymore. The soul can dominate the body. That's what self control is. That's one of the fruits of the Spirit. As your spirit receives life from the Holy Spirit, your soul can command your body and say, body, line up with God. Now, this is, this is a matter of conscience. And this is a whole nother message, but I just want to get this across to you. See, the devil, he's down here on this worldly realm. His objective is the same as God's objective, to influence your personality to gain access to your body. So he he delights in enticing us with corruption, with deception, with worldly idea and worldly influence to try to entice. Remember, don't say when you're when you sin that you, that God tempted you to sin. For every man is, is 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 sins when he is tempted and drawn away of his own lust. So Satan works with your lust, the lust of your eyes, your flesh, and the pride of life to entice you, to seduce you, to draw you away so that your soul longs for the things of the world. And once he gets you and he puts his hooks in you and he has you, he blocks your ability for your spirit to receive from God and transmit what it receives into your physical body because now he's holding your physical body hostage to worldliness. 
You see why worldliness plagues us? Because it hinders our ability from bringing God into the natural realm. That's why we, we can't see sick people healed by our hands. We're blocking the flow of the spirit into our physical bodies because our physical bodies are being held hostage to worldliness because we're interested more in who's gonna win the Super Bowl than we are who's gonna get saved this week. We're more interested in what sitcom is on television than we are about seeing souls brought into the kingdom of God. Christians I'm speaking to, not the world. Of course the world is seduced by the, by the spirit of the, of, of the devil. But the fact that Christians have been so enticed and get so engulfed in the affairs of this life that it renders them ineffective to the purpose and the will and the intention of God. So that's why he said, love not the world, neither the things, things in the world. Whoever loves the world, the love of God is not in him. Carlos, Krista, hey, God bless you. So we go to Mark 4. And we hear this parable of four different people who hear the word of God. There are those, there's the wayside, the, the, the shallow ground, the thorns, and the good ground. Now, only one of the four that hear the word of God actually bring forth the fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100. Can you imagine that three-fourths of the people that hear the word of God don't bring forth the fruit of it? I would say that's a generous uh, a, a number. But it says, it says that one of the grounds, the devil just comes and snatches the word out. The second ground, they don't have any depth of earth. In other words, they have no foundation. They don't take the time to develop a deep foundation. The word of God just, they lose the word of God. But the third, the third ground, it says that the cares of this life or this world come in and choke out the word of God so that it bears no fruit. I would say that's where a large portion of the church lands right there. They've heard the word of God. They've received the word of God. They've accepted it as the word of God. And yet when it comes time to produce the fruit of the word of God, in other words, the, 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 the manifestations of what God's power is all about, the soul, winning of souls, the preaching of the gospel, the, the healing of the sick, the casting out of demons. When it comes time to manifest the real fruit of the kingdom, no fruit is being produced. Why? Because the cares of this life have come in and choked out the word so that we're disinterested in the things that God is most interested in. Now, if we can check ourselves, observe our inner life and say, hey man, I'm not near as hungry for souls as I should be. I'm not near as needy. Why can we go on without the power of God? Because we're content where we are. We, we have come to a place in our spiritual life where we really don't need to draw out the life of God to continue in our going through the motions. So we've shelved prayer. We've shelved serious Bible study. We've shelved the idea of winning souls. And we can't even see how far we are from God. And if we don't shake ourselves and wake ourselves up, what's going to become of us? I, I beseech you, brethren, by the tender mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is just your reasonable service. This, this has to become our mode of being. If we're not seeing the very benefits of the gospel produced in our life, we have to say we've become too worldly. We've gotten too fixed on our houses, our wives, our children, our benefits and our sins and anything else that's crept in. And it's, it's robbed us of the hunger and the passion of God. And I'm getting it back and I'm going on my knees and I'm going to call a fast and I'm going to cry out and I'm going to seek God until my desire is the desire of Christ. As Jesus said, come back to your first love. Worldliness has robbed us of our passion, of our desire, of our fixation on the one mandate from God, which is to go into all the world and preach this gospel. Worldliness is robbing us. Let us shake ourselves out of it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I love you guys.